This paper is co-written with Sabina Alkire, who's sitting right over here. I see many, many, many people in the audience who I know and love, including Eric Thorbeck up front, another co-author, Tony Shorox, and so forth. So it's great to be here. Um, so uh, there's two forms of technology for evaluating poverty. Unidimensional, where you have a natural single uh, welfare variable, such as income or calories, like in our first paper, um, or where variables can be combined meaningfully to obtain one variable, such as expenditure. The second form is multidimensional, where the variables of interest really can't be thrown together in, into one welfare variable. So sanitation conditions in year of education don't really work <laughs> in combining together into one variable. Uh, or alternatively, you may be able to combine them, but you just don't want to because you want to keep them separate for policy purposes. <coughs> There's been a really strong demand for multidimensional tools recently from international organizations such as the UN and the World Bank uh, and, and individual countries. And the literature has led to a whole lot of measures. Unfortunately, most measures are inapplicable to ordinal variables, that is, variables that don't have a natural measuring rod. They just have a number attached to it to keep track of the place. And these are found very often in multidimensional poverty measurement. Or the methods can be quite extreme, such as a uni union identification, which says, heck, you're deprived in anything, you're considered to be poor. Or they violate basic axioms, such as a headcount ratio, uh, violating basic axioms of uh, dimensional monotonicity. The new methodology that we uh, put together was called the Adjusted Headcount Ratio, or MPI, that's the measure, uh, was designed for ordinal variables such as floor materials. It has intermediate identification, kind of a dual cutoff approach, two types of cutoffs, one within each dimension and one across dimensions to determine who is poor. It satisfies key axioms, which include Ordinality, you can use it with ordinal variables. Dimensional monotonicity, that if a poor person becomes, has an additional deprivation, then it will be reflected in the numbers. Subgroup decomposability across groups of people. And dimensional breakdown, which looks at the contributions of individual dimensions to overall poverty. So with this toolkit, you can take a picture that has been constructed by Sabina and the folks at OFI for Africa, and look, let's say, at Chad, and take Chad, look at each particular area of Chad, and see how it stacks up for each dimension. So this gets pretty interesting pretty quick. So the technology allows this to happen. Mind you, uh, next week there'll be a release of the new multidimensional poverty index, the global MPI results in New York City. There's been a critique that's come along, which is that the M0 measure, the adjusted headcount ratio measure, isn't sensitive to distribution among the poor. And when I get that critique, I always ask, well, where's your axiom? I want to know your axiom. Uh, some of these axioms are only applicable to cardinal measures, so that gets thrown out. Other axioms, and in particular, in fact, almost all axioms out there are having a weak inequality. So therefore, it allows poverty not to change when inequality changes, and hence, M0 satisfies. So we thought we'd sort this out by putting down a strict axiom that actually did the trick, that we could critique ourselves on. Isn't that interesting? Then construct measures satisfying this axiom and other useful properties and then apply it to data to make sure it works in practice. That's what this paper is all about. Here's a summary. We will go through a number of the axioms, tell you about the class of measures that we came up with for doing what we said, having measures that satisfy this form of dimensional transfer, including inequality and multidimensional poverty. We find that, hmm, this class of measures there's no single measure that satisfies the dimensional transfer and the dimensional breakdown, which allows you to look per dimension what's happening in poverty. And we generalize this to an impossibility result. 
that there simply are no measures out there that can do both at the same time. So we seek a resolution of this impossibility, and we do so, do so through a suggestion of Gaurav Dutt, which uh, suggested, he suggested to use Tony Shorrock's approach of Shapley breakdown, which in, generally, in general it doesn't work for the M gamma measures and other measures, but it does for one of them. And it does so well for one of them, you'll be amazed. We're actually able to solve closed form solution for the Shapley value, one of the most complicated formula that's out there. We therefore recommend the use of this class of measures in a way that's been done for years at the World Bank and other places for the P-alpha FGT indices in unidimensional. Throughout the paper, there's going to be a discussion of an example in Cameroon. So let's go to a review of poverty measurement quickly. Uh, the two-step approach of SEN, identification and aggregation. In unidimensional approach, the identification step is usually from a particular cutoff called the poverty line. The aggregation step is conducted through a poverty measure that aggregates data into an overall level of poverty. So you may have seen this class of measures before, thanks to Martin Revalian. Uh, this class, the FGT or P-alpha classes, <coughs> it's actually obtained by looking at the means of vectors. So the first vector is the deprivation vector, which basically classifies who's poor and who isn't. One if you're poor, one if you're not. Zero if you're not. Take the mean of that vector, and that's the headcount ratio. For the normalized gap or the poverty gap measure, look at the normalized gap vector, which says the poverty line minus the income level over the poverty line for each person who's poor. Take a mean of that vector, and that's the poverty gap. Square those entries to get the squared gap vector. Take the mean of that vector, you have the FGT squared gap measure. Notice that all are based on normalized gap raised to a power alpha. Our multidimensional methodology generalized the FGT class to a multidimensional case using a number of things, but uh, one of the new aspects was a dual cutoff identification. It had been floating around in the literature, a number of other people had discussed it. We put it into effect using deprivation cutoffs, one for each dimension. If you're below it, you're deprived in that dimension. And a poverty cutoff, which looked at the percentage of dimensions, weighted dimensions, in which you're deprived. If you're above a cutoff or equal to it, you're considered to be poor. The concept of poverty behind this is that a person is poor if multiply deprived enough. The approach is consistent with cardinal and ordinal data and with all sorts of identification approaches, including the extreme union approach. If you're deprived in any single thing, you're poor. Or the intersection approach, you have to be deprived in everything to be poor. And everything in between, the intermediate approach. We focus on ordinal and intermediate identification. An example of the approach will clarify. Imagine four dimensions, I'm going to say they're equally weighted, one fourth per, across four people. I've underlined all of the deprivations, such that the cutoff is above the achievement for that person in that dimension. We can convert this achievement matrix to a deprivation matrix by having a one when they're underlined, hence a deprivation is there, and zero when not. Here's the deprivation matrix. Take this deprivation matrix and see what share of deprivations people are deprived in, what share of dimensions they're deprived in. First person, zero out of four. Second, two out of four, four out of four, one out of four. Who's poor? According to this approach, you have a cutoff across dimensions. Let's say it's a half, two out of four, or more qualifies you to be poor, then the two middle folks would be considered to be poor by this definition. We then take the person who's down at the bottom over here. You notice that person's not poor, but has a deprivation. Well, poverty is not interested in people who aren't poor. Poverty measurement. <coughs> 
So we censor the information of that person. Why censor? To focus on the poor, you have to ignore the deprivations of those who aren't poor. Notice we've got rid of that from both the deprivation matrix and the censored, the deprivation score. So it, obtaining the censored versions of both of those. Aggregation is done by, to, uh, in order to get the adjusted headcount ratio, aggregation can be done in three ways. First, take a look at that matrix, the deprivation matrix. Add up the entries and divide by the number of entries. That gives you six out of 16 or three eights. Take the intensity levels there, the deprivation scores. Average them up across all people, right? So there's four of them, you gotta take an average. You'll get, once again, six out of 16. Alternatively, you can just look at the poor folks, look at their average level of deprivation share or score, that's their intensity, multiply it by the headcount ratio and you'll get the same number. Okay. This satisfies a number of properties. In the paper, we have to actually define in a formal way the two properties of ordinality and dimensional breakdown. We do, I don't have time to just go through that definition, just realize that we've done it. Dimensional breakdown after identification has been done as to who's poor, the poverty status of each person being fixed and staying fixed, multi-dimensional poverty can be expressed as a weighted sum of the dimensional components that depend only on that dimensional information in that dimension J. The breakdown formula for the adjusted headcount ratio is very simple. It's weights times what's called the censored headcount ratio added up across dimension. That gives you M0. I should mention what the censored headcount ratio it is. It means that you look at all people who are both poor and deprived in J, in that dimension, that indicator. Okay, how many of them are there? Express that as a share of the total population. That's the censored headcount ratio. So for our Cameroon example, the censored headcount ratios are listed for each of the indicators in the first column. That's one way of indicating this dimensional breakdown because if you average those columns, the, the entries, using weights so you get a weighted average, you're going to have the overall <coughs> level of M0, the adjusted headcount ratio, which is 24.8. Likewise, you might multiply the HJs by the weights and list the absolute contributions to poverty. Add them up and they give you overall M0 or the adjusted headcount ratio. Finally, you could look at the relative contributions by dividing through by total poverty. That gives you percentages. And now we start seeing how the first four dim uh, dimensions have, you know, first four indicators have more of uh, relative contribution as does fuel for this example. The new property is called dimensional transfer. And it's just like the dimensional monotonicity in a sense because you're dealing with additional deprivations for poor people, but you're shifting deprivations around. Multidimensional poverty should fall as a result of a dimensional rearrangement among the poor, where that thing is such that you start with one person who's poor and another person who's poor. And the one person who's poor shifts with the person, the other who's poor, in one dimension. They just basically trade their achievement, okay? In such a way that the dominance that was originally there goes away. So you remove some of the correlation or association, positive association, thereby deadening, if you will, the inequality a little bit. But the dimensional transfer does something else. It requires you to do the same thing for deprivations at the same time. Notice that everyone is staying poor who started poor. Okay. Here's the example describing what happens. We have a two-person example where one person has more than the other in every dimension. They're poor. Okay, And notice in the second indicator, they switch. No longer dominant. Go to the second 
group of matrices, pair of matrices, those are the deprivation matrices. Notice that they have switched a deprivation. Okay, those two things have to happen. If they happen, then inequality has fallen according to the kind of standard uh, Atkinson Bourguignon and many other people, Sui and a lot of other people approach. Dimensional transfer implies that poverty would fall. The question is, are there measures satisfying this dimensional transfer? Certainly not the headcount, uh, the adjusted headcount ratio. It just violates it. So we talk about a class, the M gamma class, which has as its identification a dual cutoff as well. But aggregation now, it's no longer just the mean of the scores themselves, but it's the scores that are raised to a power gamma. Okay? And this has an impact. So I should mention that this class has elements that come out of a lot of papers. And so you can find something very similar in the papers listed there. And they also are very similar to an FGT approach. The main measures include the head count ratio, the adjusted head count ratio, and what we call a squared count measure. So where is dimensional transfer satisfied? Anything with a gamma greater than one. But for that same range, dimensional breakdown is violated. Are there any other measures that satisfy both at the same time? This dimensional breakdown is important. And the answer is given by an impossibility theorem. No, there isn't. The proof follows a result by Potniak and so forth. The idea is that dimensional transfer requires a fall in poverty. Dimensional breakdown says, no, you can't. It has to be the same. The conclusion is it's easy to construct measures that satisfy dimensional transfer, but the cost is you lose dimensional breakdown, which is extremely important and has been used in uh, Colombia to coordinate ministries, uh, used frequently across many countries for budget allocation purposes and for policy analysis. So you don't want to lose that property. So we explore a resolution. Maybe we should use multiple measures. One measure for one thing and the other to capture inequality. Yeah, that's possible. Use the M gamma class. Maybe we could limit dimensional transfer, thus getting rid of the impossibility. No, it's already pretty limited. Same with dimensional breakdown. So we wondered what to do further. Well, paper by Dot suggests using the Shapley methods of Tony Shorox. The Shapley value approach is great in that it finds contributions of each part to the whole. It's useful, especially for nonlinear functions like the M gamma. And it takes the so-called average marginal contribution across all permutations of entering the dimensions, going from one to the next to the next. The cons of the Shapley value approach is it's extremely tedious to calculate. It's unintuitive for policymakers. And as pointed out by Shorrocks in his original paper, is problematic for hierarchical variables. Consider single person examples that we do in the paper. Pat and Joe on the next two slides. There's 10 indicators, three dimensions, as in the global MPI. The goal is to calculate the Shapley contribution for the first indicator, nutrition. Poverty, in this case, reduces to just taking the score to the power gamma for the person. So, by the way, if we look at gamma equals one, it's easy, everything's additive. So the Shapley breakdown is exactly <laughs> the original dimensional breakdown we had on the slide a while back. For others, they're very tedious calculations and I don't wanna get into what I had to do to do it. Here's the example. Nutrition, you're deprived in, Pat is, and then all of the educational variables, okay? Alternatively, Joe is deprived in nutrition and all of the living standard variables. The contribution, you would expect, would be the same for nutrition, okay? Nutrition in one other dimension. Instead, if you look at Pat and Joe, the Shapley breakdown, contribution of the first dimension, is flat for Pat, but rises and falls for Joe. You'd expect the same, but they're very different because of hierarchical variables for every gamma but two. One being M0, gamma equals one, and the other surprisingly, gamma equals two. So we were perplexed by this and studied it much further and found out that you can get a closed form solution 
for gamma equals two, the squared count measure. Define the censored headcount ratio as before. And now look at the group of people who are poor and deprived in J. See their average intensity, call it AJ. Remember, that's four dimension J. You have a different AJ. And then multiply the two to get what's called the censored adjusted headcount ratio. The theorem is the Shapley breakdown for M20, the squared count measure, has a closed form solution. Each component is obtained by multiplying each component of the dimensional breakdown of M0 by AJ. In other words, take all the tables that Ophias created for M0, multiply by the AJs, you get a table that includes information on inequality for the inequality sensitive measure and for the decomposition picture. There's an example for Cameroon. We see censored headcount ratio. We see dimensional breakdown again. And we see the relative contribution for the M0. Those are the three columns, column one, column two, and one, two, three, four, five, six. And now AJ is there. If it were constant, you'd get the same breakdown entirely, but you don't get the constant AJ. It varies across dimension, hence skewing it one way or the other, greater toward the beginning uh, indicators. Multiply each one of those three columns from M0 to get the columns for M02. We get the censored adjusted headcount, the Shapley breakdown, all there explicitly and done easily, and more importantly, I think the relative contribution there. You can compare those relative contributions between with and without inequality information. They're quite close to one another, but they vary in interesting ways. So let me conclude. We've defined dimensional transfer. We showed how it conflicts with the basic axiom of dimensional breakdown. We've derived the closed form solution for the Shapley breakdown of the squared count measure. And we recommend using this M gamma measure all tandemly at once, just like P alpha have been used over time and space. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.